My name is Eric, and here to talk with me about Real Steel, yes. and world's greatest dad, and world's greatest dad is uh, Michael. Yep. What was the idea? Dads? There's dads it's on the show today. Fathers and sons, and I guess it's and one robots. of them is horrible in each film. <laughs> There's something horrible in each film, and also something something fathers. Right. Double feature. Year seven. What year is it? <laughs> I don't even know what year it is. How are we expected to talk about these films? Um, we're going to spoil the movies yep. if we can, I guess. Mm-hmm. And you can use chapters to avoid the spoilers. Robots go. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Real Steel is the, the first film we're going to talk about. Real Steel, the one with the fighting right. robots. Yeah. Well, is so that... Real Steel was, I guess, originally touted as this film about fighting robots where Wolverine boxes with robots. I thought it was touted as the Lost Reunion film. Is yeah, that not it, what we're there doing? was that too, yeah. Also touted as Rambo with robots. Oh, Many touts of real steel. So there's Kevin Durand who plays Kimi. Right, who also plays the blob. Yeah, is in, in Wolverine uh, Origins. Wolverine. Oh, jeez. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of weird crossover things yeah. happening in real steel from a totally different arena than our audience. Don't say might arena. Be a totally different robot underground than our audience might be used to. Wolverine's made of adamantium. It right. could be a robot yeah. underground. Yeah, don't say Adam. Oh, and then Evangeline Lilly. It's right. weird coming back to this so many years after Lost. It's like seeing old friends. Yeah, it again. really is. And her character in the film is very much like an old friend type character. I mean, yeah, it yeah. feels like Kate. Years later and jaded. She play, I mean, you never really get a background on Evangeline Lilly's character. Right. But she's, I guess, Charlie's old friend, old flame they use the strategy of let's give you two or three sentences that heavily tell you what happened here. Right. No fucking subtlety about it. And then just never talk about it again. I mean, that encapsulates what I love about Real Steel. Sure. And it's that Real Steel is this film that embraces every fucking cliche in cinema. Sure. Well, so it, tell me about it, that. It unabashedly decides to be this film that, I mean, honestly... If you were to look at Real Steel on paper, like actually look at it on paper, not look at the trailer, yeah. but look at it on paper where you realize that it's a film with a lot of heart and it's about a boy bonding with his father yeah. and not as much about just fighting exploitative style with sure, robots. Sure. It really just goes through every arc that all of those films tend to go through. We have, you know, the father who's a deadbeat father and he's down and out and he's just completely irresponsible right, right. and surprise son. And then he ends up having to stick with the son, even though he really would, sure. you know, much rather just be on his own. I mean, it's I could see the trailer for that film. Right. That is not the trailer for this. Film. No, that's true. I think anybody who maybe watched Real Steel for our show or hadn't seen it before this or maybe even just the first time they saw it, there are different trailers for it. And right. Some people might have anticipated that it was heartwarming, you know, children's film sure. going into it. Uh, I didn't. Right. I thought it was Hugh Jackman exploitative robot movie. Right. Well, you and I tend to go to the same films and watch the same trailers. I mean, when you go see, I, I think, you know, Thor or something. Yeah, probably. You go see Thor. You go see one of these Marvel films that was coming out. And you get the trailer for Real Steel that is trying to compare itself sure. to the Thor audience. Sure. It's showing you that it's Wolverine fighting with robots yeah. in an underground kind of yep. gritty, dirty robot boxing film. Sure. I mean, the trailer I saw could have been called Rock'em Sock'em Robots. Yeah. And that was kind of the joke that I think I had going into seeing Real Steel was, yeah, this is going to be a movie about robots punching. Yeah. And I got in there and there were moments where like, I just sympathized with the characters <laughs> right. and I was really happy that the father and the son were getting a lot. I mean, this the film, humanity catches you completely yeah, off guard if you're it, not, if you're not ready for that, it takes you for two rides. Well, so I was wondering if you think that does the movie a disservice, the because, trailers. Well, cause you see this trailer yeah. and it advertises the film as, you know, something different than what it ends up to be. And then you go to see the film and there's, 
uh, you know what? There is more dancing robots than you expected. That's true. It's that kind of movie. Right. So does that work to the film's advantage? I mean, we talked about, you know, the humanity catches you off guard. I definitely, it hooked, had I known that it was a heartwarming father-son film, I probably wouldn't have gone to see it. I okay, mean, well, I saw it in the, the theater. Right there. Um, it got your ass in the seats and otherwise we yeah. would not even be having this conversation. Right. But I mean, for me to jump to the, the final fight scene where, where Adam is fighting Zeus. Yeah. And it's just this culmination of of both sides of the theater. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It's both trailers combining. You have this badass robot battle combined with the moment that the father and son finally, you know, become redeemable as a pair. Sure. And Charlie's reliving his rocky youth. Right. I mean, right. the moment for me, and I think it's in both trailers when they do the slow motion and Charlie shadow boxing Adam. Sure. And they do that, uh, the jumping punch where he's punching to the oh, right yeah. in slow motion. I mean, that moment for me is just amazing because it's just as badass as it is heartfelt. Yeah. You know what right. I mean? Right. That makes me care so much about these characters, but the characters are all your standard cliche, you well, know? Especially the way they start, yeah. too. Yeah. You know, you're right. The uh, the surprise kid thing right. is such a movie cliche. There is um, there's the sort of unique origins, I guess, of the carny trash. I mean, that's yeah, not for sure. our show. That's right <laughs> by this point. But that in a is, family film, carny yeah, trash right, is not right. your typical starting point. Well, and there are weird things here, and you know, the bullfight almost seems vulgar to me sure. for how family oriented everything else is. Right. By the time a robot is brutalizing a bull, I kind of. I look around like someone's going to call me out on watching this. <laughs> like uh-huh. PETA's going to show up at my fucking door. And PETA does have my address. So yeah. I mean, fuck you, PETA. But it's the perfect background for, you know, oh, debt stricken robot fighter from the future. See, I'm making this not sound like right. cliche movie. So here we are at the carnival uh-huh. where there is a debt stricken uh, robot fighter. Yeah. Yeah. This is set in the future. But um, it's sort of the, I guess, the small town southern kind of NASCAR aesthetic right. that yeah. we started. Well, I mean, this to me is, um, it's kind of akin to Rocky Six. Mm. He's not what he once was, but, you know, he's making do with what he has. I kind of wonder if he ever once was. We hear what he once was. Right. We but, see pictures. But in the, in the, even in the once was story, it's him losing. He just loses valiantly. Right. <laughs> right. You know? Yeah, loses a little better than he does today. It does seem like world's biggest loser right. of all time. Sure. I mean, you want to talk flawed character. This isn't even... Uh, the the crown champion that once was I, we hear that but we just see him fail right. over and over and do the he tries to sell his kid well, i mean yeah, that's, that's the true. worst person ever well and and i mean to go back to the idea of the clichés how fucking obvious is it that we have this ex boxer who's notorious for taking a lot of punches and then losing yeah and he ends up having to shadow box with a sparring robot sure. whose job <laughs> sure. is to take a beating and then fall down well and then that was the the kind of competitive advantage with the rocky thing when right. we watch those movies yeah it was oh rocky's the guy who's got a lot of stamina it's a lot of heart he can well on the heart too yeah, yeah. don't overlook that but he could take a beating. That was his tactical sure. advantage in the that's ring. His, that's his advantage. Then yeah. the southpaw thing, I guess. Right. But it was, you know, he was a sparring robot, essentially. Mm-hmm. And so that's uh, that's the advantage here with the robot. Right. But not necessarily with Charlie. The Charlie robot. just takes a beating. It's not he takes a beating so that he can finally win in the right. end. It's he takes a beating to lose over and over. and off. then ultimately also loses the the robot battle right the big climax moment where they finally you know overcome all obstacles and win they still kind of fucking lose yeah they lose and they're the people's choice sure. you know people's um, champions yeah but that's the thing is is really the film is so much about the underdog yeah i mean there are underdogs to the underdog in this film we have yeah, right charlie who's who's been beaten down his whole life and then he has a kid who he treats like shit sure and his best friend is like struggling to keep her business alive and charlie won't even pay her and then he buys this x boxing robot that's japanese and it gets the shit kicked out of it i mean the entire former portion of the film is the characters you're supposed to love getting the shit kicked out of them that's one of my favorite parts of the whole movie yeah that specific scene where after he tries to sell the kid Uh uh-huh and then the point where the kid goes you know just give me half the money and i'll take off yeah doesn't even consider the moral part of that uh equation 
It's just, well, I don't want to give you half the money. Yeah, I need this money. But yeah, if if that money just fell in his lap, he probably would have given it to the kid. Right. And, oh yeah, you just want to live in New York on your own for sure. six months or whatever. Are they in New York? I think I they're think in New so. York. Whatever. Every movie is set in New York. Of course they're in New York. <laughs> but instead he uses the money to purchase Noisy Boy. I don't have the money. I spent it on a robot. Right. <laughs> like, what the fuck are you well, doing with your life? That's, I mean, so, I mean. Does the, he have any redeeming qualities? I mean, His what? redemption is his humanity. I mean, sure. the characters are so believable. You take a film with these standard, I mean, they're almost stenciled character archetypes. You know what I mean? Right. By the end of the film, you're just supposed to go right. And then the father and son get together. Cause it's a movie. Sure. But instead when they're friends and he's a good father and whatever you feel, yeah, that is the logical arc of sure. this character sure. based on the series of events I've watched. Yeah. And the film doesn't go to say, well, then he adopted his son and they lived happily ever sure. after. It goes to say they almost won a battle. He redeemed himself as a human being to sure. his biological son. And then his son had to go live with his aunt. Well, he goes back and, you know, picks up his son for one last fight. Right. And as this is after partners. he's lost. Yeah. He's blown He's it. just trying to live up to their original plan at this right. point. That's, that's the most he can do is go, oh, yeah, there was that one thing where you wanted to fight Zeus. So... I guess we can at least do that. That'll right. be fun, right? And the one thing that this film doesn't do with the cliches, and I I give it so much credit because it would be so easy, is the film doesn't end with the moment you realize Adam is actually alive. Oh, yeah, there's that. God, there's I didn't kind even of know this, that There's come kind up. of this subplot to the whole film sure, from the very sure, beginning when Adam that. reaches out and catches the little boy as he's about to fall to his doom. Yeah. There's this subtext to the film that the robot, you know, the robot that nobody believed in. Sure. The reason he's able to succeed is not because he's been trained so well by these human beings, but that he has he has heart himself. Sure, yeah. And at the end of the film, they allude to it, it's completely... You mean the secret? Right. Sorry, not the secret. Not right. capital S. The we'll get secret. to that in the world's greatest dad. Oh, uh, God. But, uh, yeah, the don't worry, I won't tell anybody your secret. Right. Strange, is this a family moment for the film, or is the robot magic? Right. They allude to it, and they kind of lead it on, but I think the entire arc there is just to... It's, it's, it's an element of hope, and it's not an element of, sure. ooh, magic robot. Yeah, right. <laughs> Good thing right. they found a magic robot. Sure. If the characters don't have that level of hope and that level of dedication, sure. you're not going to see them win. You're not going to see them get to where they get to. Sure. It's not believable for the underdog to get to fight the greatest right. fighter in the right. world unless there's some rationale for it. Sure. And the characters are just, they're down and out, and they're so used to being the junkyard dog that they're they are scrappy. You know, they're going to fucking push because they they can't get lower sure they can't lose anything at this point well and that's the robots too i uh -huh. mean you want to talk about scrappy they bring home this fucking thing right so for the first half of the movie you don't even know what the the sort of poster robot where that's going to come from sure because they keep losing so fucking often you have the robot in the beginning right that gets gored by a fucking bull sure and then you have the uh noisy boy yeah the japanese one <laughs> super awesome japan about yeah, and Gets decappuccinoed um, by uh, what's right. what's his name? Uh, Midas. Yeah, with the mohawk. Yeah, and I was thinking, oh, maybe they'll win Midas. Yeah, and I'm just, <laughs> I keep going. Oh, when are we going to get to the point where we have the title robot that I can that I can emotionally invest uh -huh. in? Because I don't want to invest in the losing technology. Right. that's just not part of who I am. Right. So I'm thinking maybe we're gonna build a robot sure. or. But we find come the, upon a robot, the worst robot possible, the lamest robot. Me. And this yeah. is this is of course following. The uh, explanation as to why robot boxing is the thing sure. instead of people boxing. Which I love. Yeah, isn't that great? It's the um, the logical conclusion. Right. That's, we push this to as far as it will go, and then we realize, why are we doing this to people? Let's just do this to robots. Because we can kill robots and sure. robots. And then and then it's the original robots were the same size as people, and they yeah. looked like people. Yep. But that was boring, so yep. we made them huge. And, sure. And then after you get this whole you know explanation, like Charlie gets robots, he's going to build yeah, the best yeah. fucking... You get one of the people-looking robots, yep. and you're bored again. Oh, people bot. 
I like that explanation, though, a lot more than, oh, that Robot Wars thing on Discovery Channel came back and people actually liked it this right. time. It stayed on the air. The other thing that I love about uh, Real Steel is that it's set far enough in the future of robot boxing that there can be an underground and an overground. Sure. The the notion this of... This is like second wave right? of yeah. robot boxing. It's the fucking mankind, you yeah. know? It's backyard wrestling. When we talked on The Wrestler about right. that, yeah. It's backyard wrestling versus WCW. Yep. And it's the sort of underground that um m&m's till i collapse which yeah. is by the way still popular that far <laughs> in the future that's a it's a song on the end of an m&m album from fucking four albums ago or something there's a there's a couple pieces of strange contemporary music in this yeah not not the least of which is danny elfman scoring in an absolutely minute way for the first time in his career yeah, almost. right or not one of in the uh in the over-the-top robot movie right yeah that's true <laughs> that's where elfman thought it was time to bring the subtlety yeah uh, a little a little bit back in it's the heart he yeah. has to bring the heart yeah and you're right he's not the only oddball in the music world of real steel the m m thing's weird but that's really a, this is maybe this will go in the pantheon of weirder things i say in double feature oh but um, this is from the time in Eminem's career when I could defend him as an artist. Uh -huh. And I feel like his music has never been more at home than in an underground robot boxing sure. uh, club. Yeah. There's also that Prodigy song featuring Tom Morello right. that shows up in here. Uh, One Man Army, it's called. I think they did that for the Spawn soundtrack back in the 90s. Every action film is basically better with songs by the prodigy mm -hmm. not always better with songs by limp biscuit but yeah i won't call that one out because i don't want to hurt west borland's feelings right um, the one part that we downplayed because i think that was the part we expected everybody to be excited about was fucking robots oh yeah right so the robot i feel like we're downplaying robot dancing right but we could yeah. say <laughs> we could say uh just robots is robots in this film are so fucking awesome i love the building i mean no surprise there but yeah. i love the building robots and the bringing all the pieces together, right? And that Evangeline Lilly has a fucking shop, sure. That is like a robot chop shop right. slash boxing. I mean, it's screaming for a video game, and then the video yeah. game was awful. Don't talk about it. Oh but... no, <laughs> is there really a? <laughs> okay, sorry. Go ahead. But the thing about the robots is that it's not easy to take something that everybody's going to be so critical of. Sure. If you see a film and it's about robot boxing, it's got to really own robot yeah. boxing you got a thing about robot boxing make robot boxing awesome or you will fail yeah exactly and actually i think one of the coolest parts of it is all right you have this control interface you have a, a thing where you talk to the robots it's voice commands and then there's shadow boxing right which is if we want to go back to that rocky idea of all right it's an underdog i kind of hate when it's an underdog and they win just because of heart uh -huh. so i kind of like you know in a movie like rocky where we have the southpaw thing or in this, where shadow boxing is sort of the, oh, that's how they well, win. It's well, this, kind of win. It's kind of a return arc where it, it goes to the conversation about where robot boxing came from. Yeah. It's people weren't as cool as they should have been, so sure. we made giant robots. And at the end, if you just went back to people, they kick robots' asses. <laughs> right. Uh, World's Greatest Dad is directed and written by Bobcat Goldthwait. Sure. That's how you pronounce that, Goldthwait. Goldthwait. It's not that hard when you look at it for sure. 20 minutes and prep right. for your show. Who is this? Uh, Bobcat Goldthwait. Comedian, right? Is, he's a comedian. He's, uh, he's Jack Cheese to Robin Williams' Marty Fromage. Okay. <laughs> um, they were a comedy duo. Yeah. Uh, when they first got started. That's why they're kind of back and forth in all these movies. Bobcat, he cameos in this film. I don't know if you know that. Bobcat does? He does. He's Where the, is he? He's the limousine driver who sits on the bed. Really? That's Bobcat Gold. He looks a lot different than well, when I saw him <laughs> last. My uh my number one exposure to Bobcat Goldthwait, go figure. Uh I'm a child of the 90s. Uh was Nirvana. Sure. I'm heavily affiliated with Nirvana. Well, you he, also uh, hide this, but Nirvana is you want to go back to this comparison. It's my 9-inch nails, I yeah. think for you. Yeah, it really is. Uh Nirvana is the band that really got me into music. Sure. Um, and Bobcat Goldthwait opened for them. Um, there's a there's he opened so they would play a show and right. he would be the opening. He act. would be the opening act. Crazy. Um, and he uh, there's a there's funny. You could probably find it on the internet. Um, there's an interview where Bobcat Goldthwait pretended to be Dave Grohl. Really? Um, yeah, in That's a Nirvana great. interview and just completely fooled the news anchor. Yeah. Um, people will recognize him for his voice. I think. Yeah, it's his voice. Just for you sure. know, YouTube that shit. You will. Um, You'll get it right away. He's done a couple other films, too, and I really hope we manage to get his other stuff on the show. 
God Bless America was his newer one, but he did Shakes the Clown way back in the 90s. Oh, my God. And um, I think that's written, directed, too. Also did this movie called Sleeping Dogs Lie. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'll just give you the elevator pitch on that one. Okay. It's a movie where a girl is encouraged to tell her fiancé about all of her past, you know, so they can be completely honest to one another. And uh, that includes an incident of bestiality. Problems ensue. (laughs) It's... um, (laughs) It's got one of those aristocrats-esque posters with the dog with the tilted uh, glance oh. on the front cover. <laughs> Just weird movies, Bobcat. But um, some of the stuff in World's Greatest Dad, I mean, the, the direction is outstanding. I want to talk about the writing, though. I want to talk about the dark humor in it's this. It's so... I mean, this is... If you want to talk about dark humor, yeah. we always say Death to Smoochie sure. is the dark humor film. Sure. But this film is... It's dark humor, m- hold mean. the humor, almost. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, light on the humor. It's just funny through how mean one right. human That's being That's what it could, is. is, is really there aren't be. any jokes. It's just so dark. Right. And you know that it's supposed... I mean, it's the kind of dark where it happens, and you sit there and hold your mouth, and you say, it's, you say to yourself, I know I shouldn't be laughing. Sure. But it's hilarious. So there's that scene with Mike, I always remember, where um, there's this kind of unspoken thing between him and Robin Williams' character. Also, Robin Williams is in this. Robin Williams' character, uh, Lance, where Lance is a writer. He's trying to get all this stuff published. He's working really hard. He's been getting rejected constantly. Obviously, that's going to play into it. But then Mike writes this little fucking thing and gets published in The New Yorker. Right. Just not first, a national magazine. Yeah, first fuck it. Well, it's the worst thing ever for Lance, and it, it's comic. No, there's and, a different worst thing ever for Lance. It's the second worst thing for Lance. Uh, it's comic and how mean it is because he gets published, and his piece sounds kind of dumb. First right. of all, yeah, it's got a play on iRobot, which mm-hmm. ju- it just seems a little stupid. Uh, but it creates a tie-in for double feature, which is great. And uh-huh. that there's robots in both movies. Thanks, World's <laughs> Oh, Greatest is that Dad. the idea for the pair? Yeah, there you Films go. Films that mention robots. <laughs> but this guy's never even submitted before. So this is his first thing. And then on top of that, everyone wants to read it just to, you know, stab the knife, right. twist the knife a little more. And one after another, people enter the scene and, oh, did you hear this thing? They oh, refresh the, the excitement. Just, yeah. yeah. He was the first one sitting there to hear about this. Uh-huh. And now just over and over. The principal comes in, oh, we should read it at the assembly. And his sort of, you know, girlfriend thing, whatever, is super impressed by it. Right. It's really, it's a fucking awful situation for him. It's writing that plays into that uh, idea I know you're a huge fan of, which is lowest common denominator. I hate you love You love broad comedy. You love when it appeals to everybody. And this is coming on the heels of doing a show on real steel <laughs> right, i right. hate lowest common denominator you do you really do i, I do too it. i mean i pick on you for that because of real steel right but you know what i mean it's, yeah uh, despise it's, it's so i mean it just it shows this you can't be original and lowest common denominator it's true because it's, it's true. easy to please a mass audience as long as you do nothing interesting and nothing offensive right and that is the right. opposite of what double fucking feature is even about so he's written all these books that no one cares about they're probably the more i mean at least for him the more artistic personal books whether they're crap or not we will never know i mean we do get glimpses at the diary but that's almost a commentary that he's writing and then he finds this sort of uh doorway to mass appeal you know he writes these journals that are going to appeal to everybody and he wants to title the journals, and this is a, a perfect uh, representation of what I'm talking about. He wants to title the journals, what is it, I Am What I Hate? I, I Am What that, I Hate, or something because, like that. Because it's something that Kyle, fuck wrote. Kyle, actually wrote in, yeah. in the journal. Yeah, fake Kyle, right, actually. fake Kyle. Fuck fake Kyle. Fuck every version of Kyle. You're okay with fake Kyle, you just don't like real Kyle. I'm a little Kyle. more okay with fake Kyle. So asshole Kyle didn't even write this line, but um, Lance wrote the line. And so he's trying to explain to Claire, oh, it's a thing he wrote, and, you know, give insight to that. And Claire just goes, "Mm, yeah, that's lost to me. How about you don't know me? Because we didn't. Right. Because we didn't. And I love the way that that she says the title. She says the title as if the book will read the title to you. Right. Because you see the title, You Don't Know Me, and Uh you don't, you see it written on paper, You Don't Know Me. It doesn't go, You Don't Know Me. Right. But that's what Claire seems to think. Claire yeah. seems to think the title will scream, you don't know. Like, right. the title will have sass. Right. If you put certain words in italics and yeah. maybe phonetically 
write it out. Well, and so this gets to the, the essence of the reason I don't like lowest common denominator. You make a really good point with, well, it's hard to be original. Even though Real Steel, as you were championing, yeah, managed to right. do a couple of things. But uh, it's a lot harder and you find it a lot, uh, a lot less when something's uh, generic. Like that, that's really the word, sure. generic. Yeah. I hate it because it's the least thought-provoking possibility. Right. There's it. It's it's lacking poignance in any sure. in any case. Well, look at these fucking titles, right? I mean, a title like "I Am What I Hate" kind of sucks, but so Kyle kind of sucks, and you have to right. believe that he wrote well, it. And you kind of "I Am What I Hate" at least ask the question: What does that mean? You ask a question, right? You ask what it means. Sure. Thank you. That's exactly it. And you go through the book, and maybe you try and figure out the. You as, find it in context. Yeah. You figure out, oh, that's what the title's getting at. With yep. It's just like an episode of Double Fucking Feature. Right. It's, uh, oh, we hear a titular thing in a movie. We kind of go to see a scanner darkly. What what the fuck does uh -huh. that even mean? Sometimes <laughs> the film doesn't even know what it means. Um, but probably we just don't know what it means. And we have to sit here and kind of scratch our heads and it provokes thought. You don't know me is there's nothing else. That it's could, a statement. There's and no layer. When it starts, you know who you are. Right. And then you're familiar with don't know. And then me comes and you say, and well, who over. wrote this? And the book's over and you have all of popular fiction. <laughs> exactly. I hate popular fiction. It's the worst. No, actually, the worst is Kyle. Is Kyle. <laughs> okay. You hate Kyle, but you like Daryl. Right? I love Daryl Sabara. Okay. No, okay. No, don't get me wrong. Daryl Sabara does a wonderful job. Just the uh, just the look dad. he gives in his portrait picture yeah. is enough to right. okay check he wins. But he is he is a star as a child and but you hate Kyle. I hate him. I hate everything about him. He is absolutely the least redeemable character I've ever seen in any <laughs> film, and they make him that way. I mean, yeah. he's written to be sure, this sure. awful irredeemable person, and you need that character if you're going to have a film with this premise. If the premise is Father who has nothing going for him. Single father. Single who father. Who has nothing going for mm -hmm. him. Has worst son ever. Sure. Worst son autoerotically asphyxiates while <laughs> masturbating to father's girlfriend. Oh, God. And father's life is not better. Right. You need somebody. You need to have a son who is just as bad alive as by killing himself. <laughs> right. You, you need a son whose life sucks as much as your child committing sure. suicide sure. well and then that scene where he dies just proves you know even in his death he's going to do one more dickish thing right. to his father he uh it's a scene it's a bad made worse scene you know his father walks in sees his son die doing the same fucking thing from before that he tried to have a conversation with him about yeah. how dangerous it sure. was not that that even matters at this point but that already sucks your kid's dead i got to use that phrase we're not even talking about oprah yet your kid's dead and I owe Sylvia Brown five cents. Your kid is fucking dead. You walk in on his body. It's terrible. And then you see on his cell phone, he had some naked photos. So that's kind of bad. And they're of your girlfriend. It's even worse. And ah, he might have been looking at him when he died. Don't even think about that. So you go on his computer to write a fucking suicide note. And you see the pictures again, as if to confirm. It's like the pictures tapped him on the fucking shoulder. Sure. And said, remember when yeah. you tried to brush off the notion your son may have been masturbating to this? I just want to remind you, that's definitely what he was doing. Right. That was, in fact, the case. It's horrible. It's the signature of the humor, though. It's always a, the worst situation ever, you yeah. think. And then it gets way worse. It just gets way darker. I think um, that's what makes this type of dark humor different than necessarily the death to smoochy right. humor or sure some of the other dark humor we've talked about because that's more of a humor where it's jokes about dark subject matter sure this is dark jokes dark jokes about a dark thing that get darker and you know we always try and find that in each sort of subgenre of dark humor how does how does this make it the ballsiest type of yeah. dark humor how does this make it the most you know gut-wrenching thing but beating these jokes in, it's the same sort of thing I think you and I like in horror. Yeah. That was the, the Rob Zombie Halloween thing I think about, the French extremism thing, the just uh, beat in somebody's face and then crush it even more and then show more crushing. Yeah. And you're way over the fact that there was kind of a scare shot 
and that it's violent and now you just want it to stop right. it's just unnecessary i mean it gets to the point where it's beating you in the face yeah it's really beat every time somebody gets hit in the face you're getting hit in the face yeah and that's what's happening with just the fucking sadness sure in please world's stop greatest making death. it sad please but i'm you know i i beg please but i want it to sure. keep going that's the sadomasochistic relationship i have right. with horror films and with dark humor and it doesn't hurt that lance is just as pathetic as Kyle is the worst. Yeah, right. Lance is just completely docile and letting shit wash over him. Sure. And he, 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 I mean, there are moments in the film where you watch him not do stuff. The one that seems very obvious is when he sees Claire and Mike in the mall. Yeah. And I mean, I know me as a human being, if I were seeing somebody and they were hanging out with somebody that I thought, you know, there might have been some. Anyway, if I were in that situation, <laughs> right, right. I wouldn't be a dick about it. But I would go and say, hey, what are you guys doing here? Sure. You know, just want to know I saw you instead of passive aggressively. What did you do today? Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. I saw you. Yeah, it was really passive aggressive. Well, he's awkward. He doesn't know how to bring it I up. I don't even know if it's that he's awkward. I think it's that his home life is spent being pathetic sure because too he's pathetic. just stomped on by this horrible human being awkward and too pathetic i guess they're just the same thing yeah to me. there are scenes that i mean scenes that really almost speak for themselves uh as mini films as just little shorts and that gets back to uh bobcat's directing style and what i really like that demonstrate you know they kind of have one objective and they're almost a little vignette into themselves uh one that talks about lance you know he's sure. buying the the porn magazines He's on the street, uh, and the camera is just dead on Robin Williams. And you kind of have, I mean, the way the camera's positioned, we're looking at the back, the just sure. barely covered brown paper porn right. magazines. And you kind of have the soft music playing, and he's just staring, and then he starts to cry. Right. <laughs> and that's, it's its own mini film sure. in and of itself. Well, don't forget that then Chris Novoselic from Nirvana walks over and sure. stares at the magazines. Beautiful. And... S kind of what what are you Consoles okay i'm sorry bit. man yeah. i apologize yeah it's a short film it's true it really is there's a couple um music moments like that too i mean the the i hope i become a ghost yeah kind of thing i mean that's where... a that's a straight it, it really is almost a music video it's a music video where you require the background of the film to sure, understand sure. why maybe you do you don't require anything that's what's great that's about music true. videos you do anything and no one gives a fuck right the kind of point of this transitioning from one scene to another is to set up that everyone is going to read into this book themselves. Sure. I, I guess another great thing about lowest common denominator, yeah. who knew that would be the point of the show? Is that you don't get an answer, that it doesn't it doesn't have its own message. It just sure. conveys that it has a message. By using a bunch of general statements and being super vague, it has mass appeal. Everybody just thinks Kyle was them. Right. You know, they see Kyle sure. in their favorite outfit as someone they could get along with. They're projecting their own personality. They knew on he him. loved Ozzy. Well, otherwise, you just have to blindly accept. Oh, everybody turned out loved this book. Uh -huh. But this gives you kind of a little reason. Oh, Kyle died, and everyone just saw his ghost. They read the right. book, and they went, "Oh, now I finally understand." Sure. It explains in one music video why this becomes a bestseller. Yeah. And then you never have to address that again. Right. Well, and the my favorite of the vignettes, again, to just kind of illustrate the gravity of a point in mm -hmm. three and a half minutes. Sure. Is right when Kyle dies and it's uh, uh, love is simple. I mean, just the phrase love is simple is such a vast phrase because you either agree completely or disagree abhorrently sure. Sure. to that phrase. There yeah. is no, yeah, you know, love is kind of simple, isn't it? <laughs> right. And this is the moment where his son has died by mistake. It's not by, not even by any intention. Yep. It's a complete accident that his son is dead and you get the whole rush of, you know, the, the youth dying before their sure. elders. Sure. And even though he's the worst kid ever, you get this horrible moment and this is right after he's turned down what may have been the last fully pleasurable moment of his life, which would be fucking his girlfriend. Yeah, right. And he comes home and you watch him make this suicide note sure. and try to cover up the fact that his son died masturbating. Right. Is I a mean, miserable it's person. just this convoluted mix of disgust and you, empathy yeah. and sympathy. And you just, the song just drives home as, as, clear cut as this may be you know the son is dead 
Right. The, right. the depth of the feelings of he was the worst, but he was still my son and I don't want him to go out like this, but am I doing that for my own benefits? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so deep and it's just three and a half minutes and that could be an entire film in itself. And totally different ideas than the other. I mean, we've talked now about three vignettes, sure. sort of vignettes and, uh, and just completely different ideas that the movie wants to portray, which are all kind of different than the main points of the film yeah. too. These are ways of him kind of putting the pause on things and saying, all right, we're going to take a step aside here and we're going to just sort of digest this little bit of information about the worldview. We're going to say, all right, he has this straightforward kind of love for his son. He's going to do, I mean, I almost think about it as, I guess it's layered. It could be selfish too, but I feel like he does it unconditionally because that's just what he has to do as a dad. He's yeah. just accepting that that's his role. And so that explains, much like the other one was explaining the pop culture of the book, this is explaining, well, why did he cover it up? What was he feeling in that moment? Let's give this three solid minutes to just go, this is how that event went down. So you right. never question that again. Sure. You know, the porn one speaks to that kind of desperation, that moment of sadness, trying to dig himself out of that. At the same time, also maybe says something about remembering. It, it says something about where Kyle lives in his mind. Yeah. yeah Kyle that's... lives in this disgusting, depraved place, and it still hurts to go there. Yeah, that was something Kyle did all the time was, and, you know, this is an interesting part of the, uh, the arrangement of the two of them living together, father and son, is that Kyle could be depraved constantly. And while that's super awkward and terrible to be around, you get so much exposure to it, you don't even flinch at it. Kyle just always says awful sexual things sure. about everyone at all times. It's because he's the worst human being in the entire world right. ever made. And <laughs> right. the only thing that ever should happen to him is that he should just go in his room and never, ever, ever, ever leave because he's the worst. Unless you read his book and then you think he's Mandy fucking Lane. Right. Kyle is nothing and therefore Kyle is, is everything right. to everyone at all times. Oh, and I love they're all staring into the camera at that mm -hmm. bit. Anyways, sorry, away from the vignettes. I guess it does that with humor, too, though. Yeah. You do have these uh, miniature jokes where it's not just drive the humor home. It doesn't rely on sure. that one mechanic. It switches it up, and it just kind of, you know, it's almost one-liners. Uh -huh. There's a scene where the counselor is talking to the principal, and the principal's talking about the turnout at the funeral or whatever, and the counselor just goes, well, it was a weekday, and just yeah. moves straight on. Right. You know, the film almost can't stop itself from, it cuts back to the principal enough for him to, to like do a double take and go, what, did you just say that? Yeah. Because it does need to hammer in its own, even the one-liners that are briefly treated, we need to show character reactions just to drive it in a little bit more. So the big points to the movie, the big takeaway for me is that idea of end justifies the means. Sure. Well, it kind of follows the A Million Little Fibers idea. Sure. Um, But the thing for me is that, and I talked about it before, about how Kyle was so bad that his suicide was no worse right. than him being alive. Right. And, I mean, he just shits on Lance, and life just shits on Lance. Sure. And in the end, Lance, I mean, I guess he kind of goes, my son was horrible. He left me with no good feelings. So I guess I'm going to I'm going to get my money's worth, right? So to speak, I'm gonna I'm gonna cash in on the fact that my son is dead. Yeah, and you know he ends up touring it and going on not Oprah and a Oprah. Million... By the way, the worst human being. Yeah, ever. right. So if if we had second worst human being ever, and then Kyle is worst human being ever, yeah. Oprah would be like the worst Omega. Okay. Well, then, so Oprah enables the worst human beings ever right. is what she does. She's like sure. the overseer right. of worst human beings. She has a platform by which, you know, people can go on her show and she touts these books. Sure. We talked about capital S secret, right? You know, the reason these self-help books or these pseudoscience, well, we the yeah, these terrible things become huge because Oprah has no critical thinking and is a showbiz person and will put any kind of Sylvia Brown, Right. Psychic, whatever, Tally, nonsense. Chuck Klosterman. I mean, <laughs> right. yeah. You name it, she gives it power. Oh, fucking terrible. Well, and it's a perfect thing for this movie because it speaks a little bit to how showbiz this has become and how yeah. detached it is. You know, we get to see that behind the scenes kind of um, 
producer speak of constantly saying, I'm so sorry about your loss. Also, here's how we have a really good show. Let's mm -hmm. here's how you exploit this as best as possible. I'm sorry about your loss. I have to keep saying this and also exploit, exploit, exploit. It's a it's a gig to them. Well, yeah. And, and the thing is, is you kind of get this feeling that Lance maybe deserves some of this glory because his life has been so bad and he's been, you know, in such a horrible place. And and it's really nice that the film, instead of instead of letting it come out through improper channels and then everybody turns on Lance, the film lets Lance decide these people make me feel just as bad as Kyle did. Yeah, right. And I would be much happier with my hoarder cat lady neighbor sure, sure. and my son's weirdo abused friend. Yeah, right. And I'm going to make my own family because all these people are the worst. Even Claire, we see you know, his girlfriend of yeah. the entire film. She doesn't get him. And she, you know, she hates zombie movies. Yeah, right. And she comes they're up terrible with, for each other. She comes up with this horrible type. Yeah, they're sure. just they're not they're completely wrong for each other. Well, and is it wrong to exploit? It, I'm not the trying to that say way? that it's right. Exploitation of a human being, living or dead, is probably the generally even if they're the worst person ever. Yeah, you can't. You, I mean, that just makes you a less good person. Sure. You can exploit a bad person and other people will tell you, hey, thumbs up. But yeah, the reality right. of the situation is exploiting a person is probably less sure. moral than not exploiting them. Well, and I think the reason for that is when I think about Kyle, the place I put him as the worst person ever is sort of if you think of kind of the graph of humanity, he's that point in the curve that approaches zero. Right. The curve never actually gets to right. this person has nothing to offer humanity. It just comes, you know, as close to that as possible without being that. Right. And that special place on the graph, that is Kyle. Absolutely. Yeah. So, no, not okay. But you kind of get where Lance is at. Sure. And this is a movie about terrible people. It has to be, you know, <laughs> they have to be incredibly flawed. That's part of the character is to be uh, barely likable, if, if at all. You do feel a champion moment when Lance kind of uh, gets naked and falls. That's his sport, by yeah. the way, falling. There's the brief moment on the Fuck Oprah show where he thinks he might be found out in his own words. And it's kind of referencing that uh, Million Little... What, what was the name of that book? A Million Little Fibers. Oh, yeah. Thank you. That's definitely the title. Referencing the kind of debacle that that was, just getting it moving in people's minds like, oh, might be called out on TV. But that's not the story this is interested in telling. That's not... It feels like a climax for a movie. But it's not the right one here. So we skip over it. He gets out of that situation. And then that just becomes his awakening moment. Yeah. That just becomes the moment where he can then go back to the library uh, dedication where Bruce fucking Hornsby plays. Uh, just the movie keeping everything straight the whole time. Uh -huh. Never telling you, like you said, never telling you it's a joke. Just Bruce Hornsby's actually going to come play. Bruce Hornsby doesn't get the joke right. either. We're just going to keep nailing it in instead. And, you know, visually, I like what they do with that scene a lot. They do it throughout the movie. Everybody's in red. All the kids are in the school uniform red. Lance is standing out amongst everybody. He does not fit in here. These people who kind of love his work through the lie doesn't fit in with them. And it's his time to make that separation on his own terms. Doesn't get called out on it. Right. And leaves the rest of the people to go back to not living their life as a lie. I mean, that's the other part of the, you know, making this big lie here is that uh, it snowballs. It's at first, it just seems like, okay, we're covering up his son's honor or whatever that is. Mm -hmm. And that little lie becomes, oh, well, has your son ever written anything else? You know, start shopping the, the thing around. It's in a fucking envelope, just like his manuscripts, the mm -hmm. fucking journal. Everybody reads it. They all start living their lives based on this lie. He can't even get consolation from anybody because they always come back to, well, at least his journal helped all these people. No one's in on his secret. No one can really be there for him. So he fucks his own life over and he fucks with all of these people just because in that moment he chose to tell the one tiny lie, which makes it wrong. There you go. There's your answer. It's wrong. <laughs> Wow, that's a, that's a pretty heavy show we had there. Not really. Robots and autoerotic asphyxiation. Thanks, Double Feature. If you want oh, more no. robots or autoerotic asphyxiation, There's we've a website done David that, Carradine on the show. If you want to know what David Carradine has been in, doublefeatureshow.com. If you don't understand the reference of David Carradine on today's show, it's not to do with robots, and you can ask <laughs> us at doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Well done. The movies we're uh, going to do on the show next time venture far from family films irreversible and the woman 
Wow, this is going to be uh, fucked. Watch more fucking film. And goodbye. Uh, also, Apple Teenies are a thing that... What? Let me tell you, man. Oh, my God. Debbie Gibson this... has got me on the Apple Teenie. Okay. It's... Uh, there's a... You know I like drinks. It's like a weird fascination yep. I have. Uh-huh. And I've been without Arizona raspberry iced tea for a while. So, you know, I'm mixing it up a little sure. bit. Quite literally. I have this thing. Yeah, right? Sitting on uh, my desk here, and it's green, and it tastes like apples, and it's great. Um, you don't drink? I don't drink. St- I like to check in with you now and then. Don't drink. Uh, I don't drink either. Okay. I had no idea what uh, cocktails taste like because I haven't drank since I turned 21. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I haven't had a drink in a long time. And um, uh, and I blame, again, I'm just going to keep blaming Debbie Gibson because it's funnier to me. Uh-huh. But uh, Crystal Light has these things they came out with, which uh, they think are really funny. They call them mocktails. Wow. And it's Crystal Light, and it tastes like, uh, it's, well, this one tastes like an Apple Teeny. So there's no alcohol in it, but now I can drink it, and I know what an Apple Teeny tastes like. Huh. And I understand why everyone else is a drunkard, suddenly. <laughs> um, margarita and mojito, not so great. Don't know what all the rage is about those. Apple fucking Teeny, man.